Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. Let's open up with a word of prayer and uh, talk about a very interesting topic tonight. And we're going to actually see the Great Tribulation begin in this period, and we're going to see some things leading up to that. Okay, all right. Let's open up the word of prayer and get started. Heavenly Father, we are just grateful to be able to come into your house tonight to study your word and. Father, to grow in it, and Father, I hope that we will be um, perceptive to see what is going on in our world today, and Father, we see how things are relating and lining up to the current situation, Father, that your word says, and so Father, I pray right now, um, God, that you excite your bride, Lord, you, you excite us about it, uh, but it also lots of fire under our feet to go and and to let people know uh, what the future holds and, and the things that we're facing now and so and how it points to your return. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you just encourage us. And, Father, you also just move us in a mighty way. We love you, and we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, go ahead and take your Bibles. Turn to Zephaniah. What? <laughs> I'm telling you, Zephaniah is in the Old Testament, all right? Old Testament, you're like, of course, I know that, right? It's one of the minor prophets. Go to Matthew, hang a left. It's the best way I can tell you, all right? All right, it's right before the book of Haggai, okay? Haggai, and right behind Habakkuk, okay? (laughs) All right, we'll get there here in just a moment, all right? The word tribulation. When people say that, what ends up happening is fear comes upon people's hearts, as it should, right? As it should. Well, we know that, and uh, rightfully so. But, but tonight I want us to start getting into the portrait that God has set for us of the seven-year tribulation. And during this time, uh, we're going to be seeing in the next several weeks, we'll be breaking this down for the next several weeks, but during this time period, this reveals a time of really unspeakable horror (laughs) that can only be described as hell on earth. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and say it will literally be hell on earth. A man by the name of J. Dwight Pentecost provided 10 descriptive biblical words that characterize the coming of this dreadful time. Listen to these words. He says this. He says, wrath, judgment, indignation, trial, trouble, destruction, darkness, desolation, overturning, and punishment. So when asked to describe, he described with those 10 words. And I think those 10 words describe it in probably any better way than we could try to sit down and write a paragraph. I think he's absolutely right. You see, in the coming tribulation, God Almighty will pour out his awesome power on the entire world. And there will be 21 separate acts of judgment on the earth. You may say, 21? 21? Yeah, 21, if you really sit down and count them, when you break down the seven seals, the seven trumpets, seven bowls, okay? When you look at that, you see this. On one occasion, God will actually release four angels on the earth that is certain to kill one-third of humanity. That's found in Revelation chapter 9, verse 15. So we know that whenever these bowls and whenever these seals are broken and, and these... Um, you know, the, these trials come, the trumpets are, are, are let out. When, when that happens, man, hell is going to be released upon the earth. And in the end, God will prove to a rebellious world that he alone is God. He will let them know that, okay, through this. And there is no other God. One of the most graphic, really, descriptions is found right here in this minor prophet. You might say, well, I haven't heard a whole lot of sermons based off of Zephaniah, right? But we're going to see this right here. Um, listen to this description of the last day. This is starting with verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There are mighty men. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. What a passage. Wow. It's going to be quick. 
Okay, that's what I'm saying. When he pours out his wrath, it's going to be quick in the very end. But in Revelation chapter 5, okay, now turn over to Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, the Apostle John is even more specific about the beginning of the tribulation. In his vision that we're going to see right here, there is a scroll. And the scroll is sealed with seven seals. And it's in the right hand of him who sits on the throne in heaven. God the Father is holding on to this scroll. Notice what happens right here. Chapter 5, start with verse 1. Okay, We're going to work our way all the way down to verse 12. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, <clears throat> excuse me, and behold, <coughs> excuse me, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. What a passage. Let you know what takes place right here. Jesus steps forward. Jesus steps forward, takes the scroll while the redeemed, redeemed church and all of heaven sings praises to him, he takes the scroll from the Father. He opens the scroll. Why? Because only he is worthy. Only he is worthy. And that's what the Bible tells us right here. And it's at this point in time, the end of the world moves from a realm of possibility to really a stark reality. This right here, we have heard discussion about the end of the world. They will even be hearing about the end of the world. Those that are left here on the end of the world will be saying, is this the end of the world? And then they think it's going to blow over. But the reality is, it is coming. The end of the world is going to take place the moment, or start to take place the moment Jesus breaks the first seal. This is what's going to happen right here. Jesus opens the scroll. He breaks the first seal. And this is where we're going to spend our time tonight. Notice what happens when the first seal is broken. Revelation, flip over to chapter 6. Look at verse 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Who is the man on the white horse? People say, well, this is Christ. No, it's not. It is not. And this is, like I said, this is where I want us to spend all of our time tonight, okay? I want us to talk about this. See, this man on the white horse will be a master imitator. A master imitator. Because prophecy tells us that Jesus will return on a white horse. We know that, that he will come at his second coming in chapter 19, verse 11. So if you want to put a cross-reference there, this is not Christ, but when Christ comes in chapter 19, verse 11, he will be coming on a white horse. This man's going to ride on a white horse, but hear me, friends, he will be no savior. He's not going to be a savior. He will be given a bow. He will be given a weapon of war. He'll be given a crown. And he'll be able to go forth to conquer the world. And listen to me, friends, he will succeed. The entire world will be in his hands. So if you don't know who I'm talking about by already... This is the Antichrist. Put a block out there. If you want to write this out to the side of your Bible, whatever it may be, this will be the Antichrist. 
You see, friends, the first and most noticeable sign of the tribulation's event is the rise of a global personality, a man whose name will be on everyone's lips. He will be the Antichrist. You may say, hold on, Brother Colin, do you, do you believe the Antichrist to be a literal person? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Now, hear me, the reason why I do. Paul even calls him the man of sin and the son of perdition. Paul talks of him of being an actual man. As a matter of fact, in 2 Thessalonians, write down this passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4, it says this, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, do I believe this a real man? Absolutely. Because there's actions that's going to take place there that will take place from a real man. But listen, John, the revelator, Paul, the apostle, they weren't the only biblical writers to mention the Antichrist. He's shown even in Daniel. We've been studying in Daniel throughout this entire series. He's shown in Daniel not just once, but three times. Daniel talks about him three times. Now, as God gave him the prophetic vision about the end times. God lets him see. If you want to write these down, we're not going to read them all right now. We are going to look at the last one. But Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 through 11. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23 through 26. And then Daniel chapter 11. He is mentioned in verse 21 through 24 and also 36 through 37. Now, flip with, hold your spot here in Revelation. Flip over to Daniel chapter 11 because I do want you to see this one for yourself. We have a great description of him in Daniel chapter 11. <clears throat> this is in verse 36 and 37 of Daniel chapter 11. I'll let you get turned there a little bit. This is in verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. Listen to verse 37. He shall regard neither the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall exalt himself above them all. According to this, the Antichrist may be gay. You're like, I'm, I'm not joking. It makes sense. According to that, he had, doesn't have any regard for women. Think about that. So, think about some agendas that's being pushed nowadays. Right? Kind of makes sense. But we see some descriptions there. But here's what's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to make his debut upon the stage of world history with some type of hypnotic charm, with, with uh, charisma, and the world is going to fall in love with this man. They're going to fall in love with him. Matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, listen to how John describes him in this passage. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now you may say, Brother Colin, what, how in the world are we to decipher this? What is this talking about? Well, let me explain to you. I want you to notice that the beast rose from the sea. What's the big deal with this? Well, if you're into prophetic signs and prophetic teaching, the issue is the prophetic symbolism. The sea represents the Gentile nations of the world. Okay? It represents the Gentile nation. He will come from a confederation that was once part of the Roman Empire. Do you remember Daniel chapter 7's vision that we talked about several weeks ago? I hope you do. If not, go back and watch the video of it, okay? But remember the little horn that came out of that? Remember we talked about that? Some of you are like, yeah, I, ho I hope you do. But if not, like I said, go back and watch it. But in Daniel's vision in chapter 7 of the four beasts, the fourth beast had ten horns which represented the ten kingdoms, right? The ten kingdoms. The little horn, the Antichrist, sprouted from among the ten, which is believed to be the ten divisions of the old Roman Empire. Okay? 
So the ten divisions, which explains people say, well, you know, people sit back and say, is this political leader right now, is, is he the Antichrist that's leading here in America, all this? No, no, no. According to that, he's going to be of European descent, okay? So he's coming from that old area, okay, which explains why many scholars believe he's going to be of European descent, okay? So somehow, though, he will come in power and he will achieve dominance over mankind. He will achieve dominance. And the Bible states that after his position is secure in the Ten Nation Federation, then he will turn his destruction toward the apple of God's eye, Israel. He will make that his place. Now, this guy, and I'm going to back this up with Scripture, okay? So don't just think, well, Colin's throwing out theories here. I'm going to back this up. This guy will be a powerful negotiator. As a matter of fact, at first, he will come across as a man of peace. However, Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, says that by his peace, he will destroy many. So he's going to come across as trying to be a man of peace when he comes on the scene, okay? Listen to Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. It says this, Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. He shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without a human means. So in other words, what Daniel tells us right there is that he's going to rise into power. He's going to trick many people. He's going to be very deceitful. He, he will be cunning, as it says right there. And he will cause his deceit to, to prosper his rule. That's what it says. So he's going to trick these people, and it says, but ultimately he's exalting himself in his heart. That's what it said. But then it says this, he, does, he shall destroy many in their prosperity. So once again, for those that think that they're safe because of their money and everything else and power and prestige at that time, none of that stuff is going to matter to him. And we're going to get into economic stuff here in just a moment to back up even what I'm saying now. But then notice that when anyone said this, he shall even rise against the prince of princes. Well, now here's the deal. The prince there is capitalized. He's talking about Jesus. He's going to come rising up, speaking against Christ. Once again, murdering Christians. We're going to get to this here in a few weeks, okay, during the trials and tribulation period of this. He's going to be doing all these different things. He's going to be rising against Jesus. He's going to be having this. But I love that last part. But he shall be broken without human means. In other words, humans won't stop him. God will stop him. God's going to stop him. He's going to be broken, but not by human means. Okay? So I love that last part there in, in verse 25. But like Hitler, the Antichrist is going to make peace treaties. And he's going to try to make these peace treaties, but listen, like Hitler, he doesn't intend to keep the peace treaties. Okay? He's just providing a way in, and he will guarantee peace for Israel and the Middle East. And the, Middle, and the Antichrist Middle East peace treaty, it will catapult him onto a world stage, and everyone is going to be in awe of this man. Where did he come from? How does he speak with such elegance? And, 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 and how is he the way that he is? And everyone's just going to fall in love with him. You know, it, it really is. It's sad to those who deny the existence of God, and yet they are eager to believe in anyone and anything else other than God. This man's going to come on the scene, and they're just going to, man, they're going to jump at him. They're going to be excited about him. But I guess as the old saying goes, those who stand for nothing will fall for anything, right? And they're going to fall for it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, write down this verse. <clears throat> little, cha little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it is the last hour. Now, here's another reason why I say this is a literal man. What John is saying right there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, he says, if you notice, little children, it's the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Right there, it's capitalized. It's capitalized. If you keep going, even now many Antichrists have come. It's lowercase. It's lowercase. By which we know it is the last hour. So in other words, listen, the Antichrist, capital A, is coming. He hasn't came yet, as John was saying. At this point in time, he has not come yet. Though many people through the years have been against Christ, there is coming a man that will, who is the devil incarnate, evil personified, 
and many will eagerly worship him and even think he is the Messiah. They'll think that he is the Savior. Now, here's what I want us to kind of dive into a little bit deeper tonight, okay? His three-point plan for world domination consists of a one-world economic system. We're going to talk about that. It will consist of a one-world government, and it will consist of a one-world religion. This is his plan for global dominance, these three things. One world economy, one world government, one world religion. Okay? You may say, how do you know? Well, let's back it up. Let's look at a little study here, okay? Let's look at this. Very quickly, let's talk about each of these, okay? Number one, write this one down, the one world economy. One world economy. Take your Bibles, turn to Revelation 13. Over a few pages there, chapter 13. Look at verse 16. Chapter 13, verse 16. Actually, back up to verse 15. You know what? Let's just start back in verse 11. I'm looking back, and I'm like, well, they need to hear this. Well, they need to hear this. Well, well, let's just go to verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth inside of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sign of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Listen to this. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this one world economy philosophy. Back in 2009, a lot of these things, once again, we, we don't hear about in main media news, right? But in 2009, the United Nations proposed a one world system with a single world currency. Okay? The discussion began then. In 2020, when the World, world Health Organization released a statement recommending that people turn to cashless transactions to help fight the spread of COVID-19. Do y'all remember, even during that time, they wouldn't make change because they said it was a shortage. Well, we've got the same amount that we've always had, so where's the shortage, right? They were setting things up, and several retailers across the world immediately acted on it. Immediate. But think about our society right now. I want you to think about the availability through cashless transactions, through the exclusive use of credit cards, debit cards, smartphones, Venmo, Apple Pay, Google Pay, every little thing. I mean, think about that, right? Within just a few years, cash can be obsolete. Absolutely. Absolute. Obsolete. Okay? They're already heading for that way. Is it a coincidence? Don't just take my word for it. Google it. Every currency across the world is tanking at the exact same time. All of it is. Except for digital currency. Some of it is going up and down, and you've got to trust in different things. But even look at Bitcoin. Does anyone know how much a share of Bitcoin is right now? There you, <laughs> I was like, got the exact number. One share of Bitcoin is over $60,000. Did y'all hear that? At the beginning of the week, it was over 73000 So think about this, okay? So think about these things, all right? So here we are. That's just one share, all right? So if you bought in on a share early on when it came in, please tithe, all right? <laughs> All right, anyway, you're the preacher who's going to talk about tithing, right? I got to get him money. No, but anyway, but think about that, all right? So looking at these different things, you may say, Brother Khan, why is this important? 
Because hear me, a cashless transaction is the forerunner to global currency. It has to be. You have to get rid of all the other cash. You have to get rid of paper transactions, right? Listen, China is already doing it. China, in the last two years, has mandated, and the Chinese are being highly encouraged (laughs) to make all expenditures digital. As of just a few months ago, over 80% of their culture is using QR codes, quick read codes, you know, you don't know what that is, QR codes to exchange virtual money through digital wallets. Many of y'all know what those are, right? Digital wallets, you've seen those, all right? So, through digital wallets, all right? It has been announced, here it is, it has been announced that the People's Bank of China will be issued a digital currency electronic payment system which is a digital ledger, listen to this, that records the origin of all their digital assets. So this means that the red communist state will have direct insight into the finances and the control of finances of everyone in their country. If they want to shut it down, they can shut it down. They're doing it now. It's happening now. Friends, a day is coming when those left behind will not be able to buy a pack of gum without having the mark. And more than likely, it's going to be some form of a digital mark. Once again, we've already talked about this. We've talked about, once again, the the chipping parties that are going on. We've talked about what that looks like, how it has all of your information on it, all of your banking information, all of your health, all that different stuff. We've talked about the fact that right now, even they're using, someone shared with me, I can't remember who it was a few weeks ago, shared with me, I went and looked it up, it's true. They're using a fingerprint module to where all you have to do is hold your hand up, it has your fingerprint, and once again, it has your records on it. You just have to scan your hand. So once again, it's more than likely, it will be something digital. During COVID-19, I want you to think about this. Think about how they tried to de-platform people in groups that they didn't like or agree with. Think about that. If you put anything out that you didn't agree about the virus, you you put something out that you didn't agree about the shots, whatever it may be, guess what? You got blocked. Just because you you said certain things. I don't know how in the world, once again, our our Facebook page from here at church got continued to go as long as it did. But, I mean, people, I mean, they got blocked. Matter of fact, here's the deal. If you put anything out about this, once again, you were flagged, you couldn't post. Then, because of that, friends, places required a mandatory shutdown or it would lead to arrest and fines, as it did with a lot of churches. Many of y'all know that, once again, there were churches in California even. John MacArthur, man, he went to battle with the government about it. His church and just a few others didn't shut down, and because of that, man, they were, they were fined, they were, he was threatened, he was going to be thrown in jail, all those different things, everything. I mean, think about that, that was control. So the message, what I'm trying to say is this, the message here is either comply with the agenda or be denied the right to buy and sell and even work. You will be denied that right. You have to go along with the one world economy. That will be their message. One world economy, number two, the one world government. Let's talk about this. Never, (coughs) excuse me, never in history... Has one government completely ruled the world? You may say, what about Rome? Rome, in their mindset, did control the world, but it wasn't the entire world. It wasn't the whole world. But according to Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, the false man of peace, he says, will devour the whole earth. He will have control of the whole earth. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, says that his mouth will speak pompous words. Chapter 8, verse 23 says, A king shall arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. He will understand sinister schemes. He will be scheming his way. He will be providing his way out. He'll be doing what he's got to do to take control. And I want you to think about this. The world, which will no longer have the salt and light of the true church, think about that. Uh, that's all throughout every nation, the world will not hesitate to give this man its full attention. They're going to pay attention here. And the Antichrist will be free to set up his one world government. He'll set it up. But can I tell you this? 
It's already set up. I'm about to make some of you mad. It's already set up. And it actually started getting set up a long time ago after World War I. President Woodrow Wilson crafted the League of Nations to uphold peace through a one-world government. That was the initial plan. Set up a one-world government. Back right after World War I, right? Adolf Hitler told the German people he would bring a world to the new world order. The communists, a former Soviet Union, pledged to institute a new world order to erect an atheistic empire. And we know it collapsed like a house of cards, right? But listen to this one. September 19th, 2023, last year, while standing in front of the UN, whether he realized what he said or not, Joe Biden said this, it is time for the new world order to arise. He said it. So in other words, listen, what does this mean? What would a, what would a one world order mean? Well, let's think about it. In honor of unity, in honor of peace, what does this mean? Well, it means the end of freedom of speech. It means the end of our freedom of thinking. And it means the end of our freedom of worship. Now, we're going to get into the one world religion here in just a second. But I want you to think about that. It is astounding as far as what can happen in the name of unity through a one world thought. Right? And the reason why I'm saying that is... Think how strong the cancel culture is right now. Think about that. People are getting canceled left and right, you know, because if you don't agree with our our guidelines, if you don't agree with our way of thinking, they try to shut you down, close you down, everything else. Okay? Um, I guess it was a couple months ago, there was a comedian that he's been on several movies. He's um, Rob Snyder is his name. And he's been on Fox News lately, and he's been on different things. He's coming out, and, and they asked him the question. They said, and he's very conservative. And they asked him the question, you know, do your friends think this way in Hollywood? He's moved out of Hollywood. He's got out of Hollywood. They, but they asked him, they said, do your friends think this way that you do? And he said, well, he said, uh, most of my friends do think this way, and they agree. But they're not coming out and saying because they're worried about their careers right now. He said, but I've got enough money. That's the way he said. He's like, I've got enough money. He said, I, you know, I, I don't need it anymore. And so, but people are worried about being canceled. Now, think about this. With the cancel culture going on the way that it is and, and, and everything else, think about if there are, a, there are official laws to back it. That's what's going to happen. If you don't agree with them, you have to face the law, right? That's where we're heading. And think about this. As a nation struggles to pick up its pieces after the rapture, they're going to listen to someone who promises peace. They're going to listen to someone who has the answers. They're going to look for someone, once again, that they're going to listen to them that, that promises economic prosperity again. Listen, we can get out of this. We're going to get out of this. And here's how we're going to get out of this. And they're going to listen to that. They're going to run with it. So, so why not hand the reins of control to the man who has all the answers to all the world's problems? And that's what's going to happen. But now, thirdly, let's talk about the one world religion. One world religion. Look back in chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 15. He has granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. It's my way or the highway. And you're going to worship the beast or be killed. There's no more freedom of a religion. And what will be his chief desire? What, what will be the chief desire of this Antichrist? Well, he will try to do everything that Jesus embodies, <laughs> really. Once again, he's going to be this imitator. He will want to be worshipped as a god. And to accomplish this, listen to me, friends, nowhere is he more vigilant and diplomatic than in Jerusalem. At this point in time, whether he completes it 
or it will already be done, the Jerusalem temple will be rebuilt in the holy city. By the way, it's being built now. They're setting things up now to offer all the sacrifices that needs to be done. Google, please, please once again, don't just say, take what I'm saying as, as the word gospel truth. Look it up for yourself. All the things that they have done that they need to make the sacrifices to provide. They've already made the robes for the priest. They've got everything done. They've got everything made all the way down to the red heifer that has to be the first sacrifice. They have it. They have three of them right now. They were shipped from Texas last year. Now listen to me on this. It was shipped from Texas last year. They actually shipped five of them. Three of them are left. As of last week when I checked, three of them are left. They still have them, okay? Get on Messianic News. You can get on the Jews for Jesus site. They're keeping up these different things. So just to let you know, if you want to check these out, there's three of them left. If there is any error in these red heifers, they are disqualified. If there's one white hair anywhere on these red heifers, they're disqualified. Three of them are still left. Now here's the issue. They have to be sacrificed according to the Levitical law before they turn two. They're already one. So in other words, that tells me that by this next year Feast of Tabernacles, they are planning to sacrifice the red heifer. That's the plan. You're not hearing about this in the main news, are you? Of course not, right? Look it up. Y'all go home, look it up, okay? So that's what's taking place all the way down to that, okay? So thinking of this, once again, he will allow the Jews to make their sacrifices, well, like I said, which starts with the red heifer, okay? But the Jews will rejoice. And because he allows them to make these things, and because he's doing great signs and even wonders, they're going to think that he's the Messiah. I remind you, the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah, right? So they're going to think that he is the Messiah. They're going to treat him as the Messiah. Matter of fact, I hope I don't butcher this name too bad, but Moses Maonides, okay, a Jewish rabbi of the 13th century who wrote part of the Talmud. Listen to what he prophesied about the temple of the end of days. He wrote this, In the future, the Messianic king will arise and renew the Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will rebuild the temple and gather it in the dispersed remnant of Israel. It could be very well that he is prophesying about, uh, about Jesus and the millennial temple, but thousands of Jews will believe that this great deceiver, the Antichrist, who has brought peace and allowed them to resume that daily temple sacrifices, is going to be this man. And so here's what's going to happen. He's going to allow the temple to be built, but then he's going to do something himself. He's going to sit on the throne in the temple. And he's going to declare himself God. How do you know that, Brother Callan? Well, we already read it earlier, but... 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says this, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There it is. 2 Thessalonians, Paul says it, that he's going to treat himself as God, thinking of himself as God. That's what he's going to think. Now, I'm probably going to upset some of you right now. But this is where we're ending tonight. What? <laughs> now listen to me. The reason, <laughs> the reason why is I don't want to talk about this end. I don't want to talk about his ending and what's going to happen to him because it's a part of what is to come in the weeks ahead. And starting next week, we will start breaking down the seven seals of the tribulation. This is the first seal. He just opened it up. And so next week, we will look at the remaining six seals, Okay. But then after that, then we're start, going to start getting to the trumpets and the bowls. And then we're going to see what's going to take place to the Antichrist during that time period. Okay? All right. Hey, it's good stuff. That was 45 minutes worth, right? It's a lot of stuff. It's good. But come on back. Okay? Keep going. Now, the best I can, I'll take a few questions tonight. All right? I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I will take a few. 2 Thessalonians, yes. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Yep. Okay. Huh? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That, that's, the, that's when he breaks the seal. That's when Jesus breaks the seal. And that's the, that's the imitator is Antichrist there. So chapter 6, verse 1, through, 1 and 2 is, is the Antichrist. Oh, yeah, that Jesus is coming on the white horse. And that's chapter 19, verse 11. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Some say yes and some say no. Because was that the actual place of the temple? That's been the discussion right now. And so, matter of fact, setting up, they actually have, all right, this, this came out last month, the altar for the sacrifices has already been built. Pull it up. It's been built. It's a ramp. They've got it built. It's ready to go. And they've got it on rollers to where they can move it. <laughs> so it's built. It's ready to go. So as far as the, the does the... Dome of the Rock have to be destroyed. Well, the issue is this: some of the some of the theologians think that's actually not the place where the temple was. So some say yes, because that's where it's going to have to go right there. That was the original temple. But other people were sent back. Scholars are saying Ron White was one of them that said that's not where the temple was. That's not that's not it. So. Hmm. Yep. They have the basins done, all, the, all that stuff is done. Matter of fact, they, so last year at the Feast of Tabernacles, once again, y'all look this up, last year at the Feast of Tabernacles, they finished all the trumpets, and they blew the trumpets, the shofar trumpets last year for the first time. Do you really? Awesome. I can't blow it, man. <laughs> That's awesome. But they finished them all. Yes, ma'am, Miss Jane. No, no, the sacrificing of the red heifers, to, to, for, to her question is, does that have to happen as far as for the sacrifice? No, no, no. That just kicks off for them to be able to, to do all the sacrifices first. That has, that's the, according to Levitical law, that has to take place. That's the first thing. But when he comes into being and saying, like, he will say, let's do it. Let's do it all. Let's, let's have the sacrifices. He will offer that up and everything else. But for them to do that, this will kick off. For them to blow the trumpets last year, for them to have everything, for them now to finish the altar of sacrifice, it's done. I'm telling you all, go look it up. There's a picture of it. You can see it. Um, <clears throat> they don't have much left. So saying this, according to what we just now read, according to what Paul said there in, in Thessalonians, it will happen the way Paul wrote it in Thessalonians, that he will, set himself, he will go to the temple. He will set himself up as God. There will be a temple. Yes. Yep. That, that he sets himself up as God in the tribulation period? I think it's going to be during the tribulation time period. Yeah. See, once again, he's going to come the first three and a half years. He's going to, be, he's going to calm everything down. This guy's going to come on the scene the first three and a half years. And we'll look at this next week. Okay. For the first three and a half years, he's going to come in, calm everything down. At that point in time, at the three and a half year period, he's going to break the treaty. He's going to break the peace treaty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. But he's going to, at that point in time, then he will break the treaty. And then because of that, that's when everything's going to be starting to rock and roll at that point in time with the tribulation period. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Yes, sir. No, you, it's, they're going to have to live in hell on earth. Yeah, and most won't make it through. Most won't live. Matter of fact, it says right there, they're going to be killed. They'll, they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll be marked. Yeah, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be sought after. Yeah, more than likely. Like, that's what I'm saying for those that say, well, you know, if I don't make it the first time, it's okay. You know, I, I still, 
No, it's, it's going to be, number one, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to live even afterwards, more than likely, as I said last week, if, if you're not going to take it now when it's easy, you're, you're probably not going to take it afterwards. You know, you're going to try to live with society and go along with society and all that. So, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for those, for those that die during that period of time that is living for Christ and don't take the mark, yes. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you're asking, Ray. I'm a, no. All right, go ahead. I saw a hand over here right fast. No? Oh, okay. All right. Well, hey, y'all, let's close off the word of prayer, and uh, we'll be dismissed tonight. Uh, Once again, come back next week. We start breaking apart.